All right, hello everybody. Uh, we're coming to you live from the Youth Bio Lab at the Albertson Research Center here at the St. Bonas Hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, in Treaty One territory, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Cree, Oge Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the uh, Métis Nation. Um, these meet a scientist chats. They're a weekly live stream where we're going to have conversations with people from around our building here. Uh, not just to find out about the work that they do, but more importantly, to actually meet the people and find out a little bit more about who they are and, and what they do and why they love doing the things that they do. Um, also, maybe welcome to viewers from across the country this year as, as part of Science Odyssey run by NSERC. Um, science Odyssey is all about sharing Canadian science and meeting some of the curious people behind it. And I can think of no one better than, uh, than today's guest to kind of share that, that curiosity and passion for science. I'll encourage you to, uh, to join us in the chat here if you're joining us live on YouTube. Uh, throw in some questions as we go. This, this is a conversation not just between me and, and today's guest, but, uh, but between anyone out there who wants to, who wants to participate and, uh, and be involved. Uh, we'd always welcome, uh, welcome your participation. So um, our guest today is Dr. Ian Dixon. Um, this is one I've been really looking forward to and I've, I'm excited to have him on um, because he's really my mentor. He's really the reason that I'm here in, in this building and, and doing the thing that, that I'm doing here this year. Uh, Ian is a principal investigator. He runs the molecular cardiology lab here at St. Bonas Hospital. Um, he's a professor with the Department of Physiology and Pathophysiology uh, at the University of Manitoba. Um, but he's also someone I would consider a, a really good friend. Uh, I, when I started here in, in 1999, uh, it was in Ian's lab, and that was really my first exposure to, to real medical science and, and how lab works. I'll sh show this embarrassing picture of, uh, of us back in the early days. This was, you can see down the date stamp there, uh, September 1999. Both of us had uh, a lot less gray hair at the time. Uh, <laughs> A lot more hair for me, actually, but but really that this was this was my introduction to um, to to lab work as as it starts. And Ian started a passion in me, and uh, and here he is. Here uh, we'll drop the screen share. Uh, Ian really shared his passion with me, and I'm excited to have him here to share his passion with uh, with everyone else. So welcome, Ian. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, it's it's. Um... It's a pleasure to to be here today and and to join in this conversation. And uh, wow, that was a very embarrassing picture. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a, it's it's sort of shocking how much we change over over the years. And and I guess there's a number of really good reasons for that. But but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah, great. I, it's uh, I always like looking back on those pictures. I mean, that was 1999. We're over. That's over 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and looking back at a picture like that just always makes me think. And, and it's something I like to share in these chats is like science just isn't about, you know, what you learn in school. Like I didn't just come out of university, walk into your lab and know everything that I was doing. And it's same as, you know, you're not going to walk out of high school or even out of a graduate degree. Um, so much of it is really about the people that you get to work with, uh, the people that, uh, that you meet, the relationships you make. Yeah. It's really not just about what you know. We'd even mentioned that just before we got, got live here, you know, talking about old friends that we've known over the years. Like, yeah. Well, uh, uh, one of my bosses, um, the very first one that I had was, was a professor from Japan, and he, and he said to me... Um, I can teach you things and I can write down formulas and I can, and he used to do that. He would write down uh, all the math and, and formulas that we needed on the back sheet of a brown piece of wipe up paper from that he would take from the lab. And we call it our Makino, his name was Naoki Makino, called it our Makino notebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many great notes have been made on the back of paper towels in the lab. Oh yeah, yeah, he was a king of that. And, and the, um, but the thing that he impressed upon me was he said, you, you have to own this. You have to want, I mean, you'll know yourself if you want to do this. If you, if you get into it and, and, and ask a question yourself, suddenly it becomes yours and therefore your investment. Um, 
is a great motivator for most people, not for everybody, but, but certainly it was for me. He was right on the money. And, you know, sure enough, it becomes um, with a little push and, and, and asking the right questions. And as you said, it's not just about getting degrees and whatnot. It's, it's all the stuff in between. But the one big thing is to, to be able to uh, generate enough interest in yourself just to cross. There's some sort of invisible hurdle that when you ask a question that is a little different from what everybody else has asked, it becomes yours and then you can really dive into that problem. And, and that's one of the things that we have students into our lab all the time. And, and one of the things that I say to them all the time is, um, you know, that's, that's the wonderful part about it is that you really can carve out your own piece. The way I always talk about it is, you know, you, you study heart disease. That's where I started out here too with you. You know, heart disease is this huge puzzle. Huge. But when you get into science and having your own lab or even being a part of a lab, you can carve out your own little piece of that puzzle. And oh, yeah. These puzzle pieces are really small. We'll get into this in a minute, but they're so small, but it's still your piece. And, and you can discover something that nobody ever knew before. And even though it's so yeah. tiny that most people don't understand what you're even talking about half the time, yeah. um, that's still your piece. And that's available to anyone, whether you're that brand new student like I was, you know, brand yeah. new into the lab, I could yeah. have my own little piece too. And, and that's that's yeah. the fun of it, right? It is. And, and um, yeah, the funny thing is, you know, we... I call myself a, a basic cardiovascular researcher, but you know, 90% of the stuff that I look at has links to cancer um, work and, and actually none of how I got into, none of the background of how I got into what I'm looking at came from cardiac work at all. It was all, you know, parallel stuff in, in cancer. So uh, the, the cancer people uh, deserve a huge bow. They're, they're usually about 10 or 15 steps ahead of everybody else. Yeah, and, and people, <laughs> take, people take really interesting paths. And I don't think people realize how, many, how much crosstalk there is between all these different disciplines. And yeah. people take really interesting paths to get to where they are. So, I mean, I threw up your titles and things, you know, your uh, professor in Department of Pathophysiology and Physiology, and, you know, big words. But what was your path to get there. Maybe you can share that with, because this is always interesting. Maybe we got some grade 12 students out there who are thinking, oh, I'm going to go to university next year and I like science. What was what was your path to get to where you are? Like you're a Manitoba, you're Manitoba born and raised, right? I, I know. I am. Yeah, I admit that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm proud to be a Manitoba born and raised. We have a farm which is about 60 kilometers south of the city. And I spent a lot of time out there as a kid and observing, you know, nature. It sounds sort of corny and hokey now, but um, looking at how things interact and how certain patterns, you know, every day I would spot, you know, uh, one small flock of a certain species of birds feeding on a certain species of tree. And, and so those observations build up. I, I then, um, you know, I had lots of chances to to, um, you know, I get up close and personal with biology and all sorts of animals and whatnot on the farm. Uh, one time my cousin and I uh, came very close to uh, a snapping turtle in the Red River, uh, stuff like that. It, it amazed me at how prehistoric this thing looked. And I thought, I don't think this is, this, the, this basic animal has not changed in in probably millions of years. I mean, it still has plates on its tail that resemble a stegosaur, you know? Sure. It's really, so stuff like that kind of uh, started making me think as a kid, maybe um, I could do this if I found some sort of niche. And I remember talking to my dad, who was also a biologist, and he kind of advised me to take a trade, like be a plumber or, you know, do something like that, because it's a lot better work. And in those days, what he was talking about was there wasn't a whole lot of funding for, for wildlife biology, which is kind of what I thought I wanted to do. So I took a degree in zoology. But while I was doing, there's two streams in zoology, and I love zoology. And when I retire, I'm going to go back and, and, <laughs> and spend more time doing zoology. But, but there's two streams. So one is ecology, which is great. And the other is sort of physiology based stuff. And, and I found that I really enjoyed the physiology part of it. And when and we say so, physiology, maybe, I mean, that might be a term that maybe doesn't come up so much in okay. some of our viewers. Like what do you mean when yeah. we say physiology, what are we talking about? 
Yeah, it's always it's always confused with psychology. Yeah, <laughs> but it's completely different. So physiology is just essentially what is function. What is how does the cell achieve what it's doing as you watch it? So, what are the basic mechanisms uh, that mm, push a cell to do its particular function? And so, um, physiology then is a very broad term, but it invokes now. It's not just like, you know, function in real time, but what are the genes that are evolved to support the proteins that, that lend that function, for example. So, so most physiologists these days really don't even think of themselves as that. They, they probably think of themselves as molecular biology people, which means study of genes. So they, more often than not, they're, they're putting genes in and taking genes out of um, animal models, like mice, for example, or very, handy to work on because they have such a, uh, a rapid uh, um, generation time. So uh, zebrafish is another great model, et cetera. These, these, these models allow uh, you know, people like us to, to insert and take away genes to really um, ask some pretty hard questions about, does that gene actually become important for a disease process? And so right. that becomes then the basis for figuring out fancy drugs, what they call single molecule drugs to you know, um, change the course of uh, a particular disease, even something as complicated as say heart failure. Yeah, and that's what, I, when I talk to kids too, I think that's one of the things I say is, you know, so we're interested in heart failure or, or cancer, or you know, it could be the coronavirus, doesn't really matter. Um, as, as disease researchers, as people who study disease and, and or the fancy word, my, you know, pathophysiology, right? Yeah. You have to understand how everything works yeah. before you can understand even why things are going wrong in, in yeah. these disease situations, right? So, I mean, oh, true. I, as long as I've known you, you're always tinkering with something, whether it's cars or motorcycles or, you know, telescopes or whatever. Um, right. But <laughs> that interest in, oh, and that was my interest too, is, you know, we've got this these trillions of cells all put together where we're running around all the time doing all these things. And like, yeah. how does this all work together? And, and how do we keep all these systems that we have inside our body um, working in some sort of way that'll last 80 or a hundred years? Um, yeah. That's, that was always my entry to it. And I know you, you kind of share just that fascination with it, really yeah. that physiology, how does this all work? together in, in some way and what happens when things when things go wrong right that's really the job yeah well you know it's it's a great question and another um i, I had a professor named uh dr martin samoyloff we called him marty he he insisted not to call him doctor he's one of those guys like me and so he he was a guy who said you know um the evolution of, of genes is really where it's at. And what he was talking about was, when you look at an organism, you we kind of take everything for granted. Like last night, I actually did go out and take some pictures of the stars. And as I was taking these pictures, there was a fox who was very inquisitive and he would come within, you know, I'm talking three meters of me and was looking for food. And you look at that, that creature, that organism, and you think, you are so specialized. He's so special. He's got a beautiful coat of fur. Doesn't matter if it's minus three, like it was last night. <laughs> I was freezing because I'm totally <laughs> not evolved to sit there at minus three. But this fox is perfectly comfortable. And, and he's wary and fast, and all of his senses are tuned in to me to see whether he can gain some sort of advantage, meaning can I get something to eat and therefore propagate my genes better, you know, et cetera. But, but anyway, Marty was this guy who uh, really instilled in me a, a completely different way of looking at, at, at nature and to kind of take each thing that I saw and say, why is it so specialized? How does it fill that niche? And, and what is the mechanism for, for gaining that evolution of genes? So that's a much bigger question than, than just looking at function. Sure, but, but I but thought maybe we'd yeah. share, like when I start, I started in your lab and, and uh, you know, that's really when I look back on it is, it, yeah, how do things change, right? Like, I, I think that's been a big part of your research program over, especially looking at this, this one type of, type of cell. We've mentioned the word cell a bunch of times here. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll share the screen again here and, and just kind of show people 
um, this this special little cell type that that I know you've been interested in for a very long time. I, I share it with kids often saying, you know, there's people in this building who just study this one cell type and they want to know, you know, they, they'll do this for 20 years. And if you're some kid, that, you know, who's 10 year old or 12 year old or 15 year old, think about studying that one thing. But it's still something that fascinates me to this day. It's still something I share with all these kids. So I, I'll just, I just got a little video up here. Um, you're a fibroblast guy. So for people who study hearts, um, you know, a lot of heart scientists out there, you know, whether you're studying the whole organ, when we get down to that cellular level, you know, a lot of heart scientists would study the, the muscle cells, right? The cells that actually, you know, do the pumping, do create the actual force and, and, and that pumping function of your heart. Yeah. Um, and when I showed up in your lab, you know, way back there in 99, um, you know, I probably heard of a fibroblast cell before, you know, I probably read yeah. about it in a university textbook, but it's one of those cell types that just kind of gets, you know, oh, they do something around other cells. No, they're not that important. But they provide glue. <laughs> yeah, it, but that's the neat thing is like, they're so important that if you didn't have these little fibroblast cells, not only in your heart, right, but in your skin, in your kidneys, in your lungs, in your liver, yeah. um, you would just be a puddle of cells on the floor. Like they're yeah. really the cells that, yeah. that glue all your other cells together. And I, I've, show, I've seen this video, I'm going to show you, share this video. I've seen this video probably 10,000 times. And every yeah. time I watch it, I still think, this is fast, like these cells are fascinating. So this, yeah, what we're gonna yeah. show, just so our viewers understand, there's a little, these are cells that would be in a dish, something like this. So we can take cells out of bodies. We can keep them alive outside of bodies. And then you can check them out under your microscopes. And what this video is going to show you is these are fibroblast cells, these sticky, gluey little cells that, that Ian's really interested in. Um, but what we're gonna watch is 24 hours. So imagine you're staring at these cells for 24 hours. We're gonna speed that all up into one minute so you can see what these cells these cells really do. Now, these ones aren't heart fibroblasts, but they're kind of the same. Uh, so if I start this up, you can see what they do, right? Like they have all these characteristics or the, the exactly. word you might use in grade 11 or 12 is, is phenotype, right? Like yeah. they, so how would you describe their, even just looking at this, anyone watching, they're sticky, right? They're, they like to move around a lot. They divide. Yeah, like that's an amazing thing right there, even for someone who studied mitosis, right? Again, I learned mitosis 10 times and never really seen it in action, and there it is, right? Yeah. Um, really important in your body to hold everything together, but they can change too, right? Yeah, look how dynamic they're moving. They. It, they, they, it's almost like they're shaking hands. They check out what's going on next to them. They move on and continue doing whatever it is they do. But yeah, it's almost it's, a touch and move away. Like they don't even love yeah. being crammed in super tight. They kind of no. touch and move away from each other, don't they? Yeah, that's right. If, if there's too many of them on a plate like this, and you can see them dividing just there, it's very cool. Um, there's too many of them. They actually slow down and become what are senescent cells, right? So they, they stop um, their primary function and they kind of go into hunker down mode. Like they're sitting around a campfire thinking about what, what are they gonna do next? And ah, we've got too many neighbors too close by. So we've got to preserve resources. We'll go into kind of a, a half awoke mode or half awake mode, you know? And, but I guess they can also go the other way, can't they? Like that's- Oh yeah. Yeah, like if you look at, especially at the beginning of this, uh, there's just a couple of cells in the field. You can see how um, how dynamic they are. It, it's pretty amazing, and and not only do they are they visibly dynamic, but they actually change what they look like and they change their function as well. So uh, <laughs> there was an old blues guy, and I can't remember his name. But he used to say, you know, don't eat too much uh, fat and oil, it'll angry up the blood. And I, I think <laughs> what, <laughs> what these cells are, when they, when they get too much stimulation and there's not much of, of the other, of their buddies around them, they activate, they become hyperactive, hypersynthetic, they make way more. Okay, so their main function is to make extracellular matrix, which is a fancy word for lots of collagen and a couple of other really interesting molecules, but they just go into a kind of a hyper synthetic mode where they're 
They're cranking out more and more collagen just so that they're comfortable in their own environs. Right. And so like, I mean, that's, and that's without getting too heavy into the research part of it. I mean, that's really what your research program for many, many years has been, is really yeah. looking at, you know, why do, why are those cells change? Like, how are those cells changing? Why are they changing? What's going on inside those cells? Because can you explain a little bit like, so if someone's had, say, every, most people would be familiar sure. with the heart attack. If someone's had a heart attack, that's going to damage that muscle of the heart, you know, yeah. maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, depending on how big that heart attack is. Yeah. But these fibroblasts, like what happens to them after a heart attack? Well, they go into panic mode. So, so okay, we're, we're going to roll it all together here. <laughs> so as, a, as an organism, you and I are probably not really designed to live more than about 40 or 50 years, right? Sure. And so therefore, uh, key systems like cardiac muscle or heart muscle will never mm, age to the point where it has to deal with um, with reduced blood flow through plugged up coronaries, which is very common. It's atherosclerotic disease. And so if a patient who lives, you know, let's say he's in his mid 70s, he's had a he's kind of a business person. He's got a type A personality. He likes to go to McDonald's on the weekend. You know, he probably eats a lot of fatty food. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm painting is a picture of a guy who might have some of that uh, coronary blockage and, and might have an acute MI or heart attack, as you just mentioned. So MI is just a shortening of myocardial infarction, which is heart attack. So what happens is you lose a huge chunk of the muscle of the heart. And if that doesn't fall apart and, and uh, you know, disintegrate in that in that ischemic event, which means when the heart actually is uh, low on oxygen, the, the muscle cells start dying, the wall thins up. And what happens is these fibroblasts kind of race to the rescue like firemen. They activate, they, they go from making um, matrix at a very sedentary pace, like almost nothing. They just sit there to becoming really active cells making lots of connective tissue to try and save this, this, this ventricle. And almost, a, almost to patch it up, right? It's like a patch, it, literally to patch, the patch it up. in there. Yeah. And they do a great job, but the problem is, is that they patch it. And so within two months, if you survive that initial infarct, which most patients these days do, mm -hmm. you know, the, the critical care now is so good that almost, you know, 80% or more of these patients sure. will survive that acute problem. So what happens then is that these cells activate, they make that big patch, they make it so well that it actually holds up. But then the problem is they keep making it and they keep making it. And there's no, there's no genetic code for them to say, hey, stop, stop, like we're done here. They, they don't recognize that because why? Because we're not evolved to take that. So, so the cell just keeps on wound healing. And not only that cell, but all the cells that it splits. And we saw in that great uh, slide that you showed that these cells are pretty um, mitotically active. They will split apart. There's more and more of them. They tend to all initially come from within the heart itself. And then they divide and they become very numerous. So that after a short while in that damaged portion of the heart, that's the dominant cell type. There's no more muscle left. It's just all of these crawling, what we call myofibroblast or muscular fibroblast. So they, they do contract like a muscle cell, but it's very Frankensteinian, herk herky-jerky. Sure. And, and they lock, they don't, they don't relax really. So they contract and they, they lock down. And that's because they're doing wound healing, which means drawing all that deposited matrix together. Yeah, and, so, and like the analogy, the way I always talk about it with kids too is, um, you know, you can imagine, it's really, it's, you've said it a couple times, it's wound healing, right? Like it's, it's almost, if you get a giant cut down the side of your face, yeah, that's destroyed a whole bunch of tissue and little fibroblasts are going to crawl right in there yeah. and glue you back together. And that's but right. the thing we all know is, and, and anyone watching would know is, well, that scar on your face, okay, it'll scar, yeah. it might be there for the rest of your life. But over the next five years, it's not going to crawl across your entire face <laughs> no. until you're until you know your your eyes are scarred shut. But that's yeah. kind of what's going on in the heart, right? Like they yeah. stay super active, yeah, um, and they're they're gumming up the whole works almost. So yeah. so your heart just can't do its job anymore. 
So, so what scientists have found now that the term fibroblast is way too general. So, so these cells are all listed as fibroblasts, but in reality, the skin fibroblasts, quote unquote, are quite different from lung fibroblasts and are quite different from heart fibroblasts. Oh. So this came, this was discovered way back in actually around 1998, but it was, it remained like this sort of blind end and nobody really took it seriously. But in 2008, so the, the field was almost dead to this fact. But in 2008, there was a guy named Thomas Thum in Germany, and he discovered that, you know, not only are cardiac vibes a separate entity, they're, they're their own thing, but um, that they're causal to, to what is heart failure. So then the, since 2008, my particular field, which is to study these cells, these cardiac fibroblasts, which are actually unique, um, has just taken off. So every lab, every big lab that has almost any funding that was involved in heart failure is suddenly on to this. So where we used to be kind of the voice in the wilderness, especially when I was doing my postdoc way back in the early 90s in Toronto, I mean, some of my professors even would look at my data and go, well, I, don't, I don't know, I just don't believe this. And, and, and that's the way science works and it's all good, but you just have to keep hammering away. If you get the data and the data seems to support you know, a certain direction of, of um, fact uh, trail, then, then you just go with it. And, and hopefully you can keep your mind open enough to, to accept those facts and, and to change the model a bit. And, but you're right, so you bring up a great point. The skin is totally different. So those cells, those fibroblasts in the skin, if you get a cut there, they have, uh, there's, a, there's a shutoff mechanism and it's called apoptosis. And so, those cells die, they do their job, they plug the hole, every, you know, your skin feels itchy for a while, that's them pulling down on each portion of the cut and it itches. And even if you get a scratch on your hand or something and it's healing up, you can feel, you wanna itch that scratch a little bit after a week or two. And that's because the myofibs are pulling. But those cells get that, that signal called, called apoptosis and they just all go away except for a tiny number of them. And it just slowly turns over that scar never to change again. But the problem in the heart is, is so that apoptosis signal, that death signal is given and they get it and they're sitting poised to die, but they just don't. And there's a number of factors now that, that have been identified that say, hey, wait, no cell death for you. You're gonna be senescent. Yeah. And not only that, but now we've discovered that there's about five or six different types of myofibroblasts that sits in that scar. And they make, um, they're angiogenic, some of them, which means they make uh, the tubes to feed blood. So they yeah. make microvasculature. Cool. It, it's enormously I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. And it's just these paths that you walk down as a, as a researcher, right? And, and you follow that trail of data and those paths just start to split and split and split and split. It never yeah. ends. And that, I mean, that is the fun. Sometimes those paths do end at a dead end and sometimes yeah. they move back around. And Oh, well, we don't have the tools to go any further. Right. Yeah. And that's really the fun of it. Um, I wanted to show a few pretty pictures and stuff here too. Um, we, okay. we saw the video of the fibroblast, but I mean, I kind of said before, you know, as, as your lab looks at, looks at these cells, it's not just staring at the cells, you really are peering inside those cells to see what's changing on the inside, whether it's the genes inside the nucleus or, or proteins in the cytoplasm or yeah. membrane things like there's so many different things to study, even inside the cells. I'll, I'll share, I pulled, I got Sunil from the lab to just send me a few nice, pretty fibroblast pictures and stuff. Uh, just that we could have a look at and, and maybe share with some share with some folks out there. Um, we saw the video. Yeah, this doesn't have much color. You can kind of see what they do, but to peer inside, there's lots of techniques that you can use um, where we can, you know, really light things up inside cells. And I threw these ones in here because they kind of. We'll, we'll talk about some of your other photography in a minute, but these kind of made me think of some of your other photography where we can look at things inside cells. There's yeah. the nucleus all lit up and really trying to understand how these fibroblasts change when disease strikes or as they're changing into those hyper fibroblasts or those less hyper fibroblasts, how they're changing. And, you know, this is from a paper a few years ago. I don't know how well this shows up on people's screens out there. We can make different things light up and stack them all in one image to make them, uh, make them look really neat. How that little, uh, 
nucleus is kind of nestled in these other structural proteins, right? Your smooth muscle actins and. Yeah. Yeah. But this, I, and even stuff like this, looking at how cells die. Like we, if we want to understand how to keep cells alive or how to regulate them, we can look at how cells die or how they change. Sunil sent me yeah. some of these two, which I think are just oh, beautiful, beautiful pictures again of, of, yeah. of um, cells, tissues, again, all those little blue stained nuclei we can see in the, in some of these images. Mm -hmm. um, so students know what we're looking at. Um, so again, in, the, in, the, in the second picture there, Steve, you can really see uh, with that, that highlighted green sort of uh, aura, if you will, yep. you've got um, a ton of cells that are staining positive and, and that indicates a concentration of those activated myofibroblasts that we were talking about. Yeah, and even pictures like this, I think to show to students, even if you don't understand what's going on here or what you're looking at, um, it kind of comes back to even what you were saying about being a kid out in the, you know, out in the woods or out in the field yeah. is, looking for differences, right? Like looking Same for thing. things, using your brain and your, and your powers of perception and observation. And I mean, that's what humans brains are really evolved to do any animal, right? Like looking for, looking for change. Yeah. yeah. That's what, what can, we're set up to do. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that's part of being a scientist is, you know, we can take all these beautiful pictures, but how do we know enough and, and how, how can we look at things like this to pull information out and they're be beautiful, but there's also a lot of, of data involved in, in a lot of these images as well. So I, I threw these ones up again. I have no clue what's going on here. You obviously know better than I do, but to me, almost this, these bottom ones almost look like I could be looking at a far off galaxy out there, <laughs> yeah. but instead, instead we're looking, you know, we're looking into a cell, right? Like this is yeah. microscopic. I'm not sure what the, I can't remember what the scale bar is down here, but that's probably, you know, we're looking at micrometers of yeah, it might be 50 microns, I think, something like that. Yeah, but but to mm -hmm. me, I, I throw these in here because I wanted to share some of your other photos with uh, anyone out there watching out here. Um, you know, Ian spent a lot of time in his life looking down microscopes and and uh, looking at what's going on inside the microscopic environments. Um, but he's also a tremendous astral photographer, um, and this is something you've started off really over the last few years. But kind of instead of peering through the microscope, kind of looking out to the uh, to the heavens. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I love uh, it's, it's so. Yeah, it's funny. I, I again, when you, when you're when you're a youth and and you're faced with all of these possibilities at university and school, you really uh, are encouraged to choose one, maybe two. And so one of the uh, the things that I also enjoy uh, looking at and and then thinking about is deep space. And so thinking about how, for example, right now, if you're an astrophotographer or an astrophysicist or uh, somebody, even an amateur uh, person looking up at the stars like me, uh, we call this now galaxy season <laughs> because there are two, um, there are two constellations, Coma Berenices and also um, uh, Virgo that pop up out of the east, rear up out of the east at this time of the year. And, you know, in the middle of the night, they're conveniently placed right above our heads. And, and there, they're so far away from our own galactic plane that we don't have all these, you know, globular clusters and, and trillions of stars getting in the way. And yeah. so we can actually look into very, very deep space and, and look at um, space, uh, which is unfettered by our own uh, local pollution of stars, <laughs> if you will. Sure. So, so it's awesome because you can, in one small field of view, you can, um, you know, usually see, uh, depending on how wide the, the field of view is, you can see anywhere from, I took a picture last year with over 200 galaxies in it, and then another one just last week with about 11 or 12. And you've got everything under the sun. So each galaxy has its own appearance and phenotype. Sure. You, have really, yeah. models, you have the grand you have the blobs, you have the irregulars. You yeah. have some that are smashing together and and through tidal forces ripping each other to pieces and sending out these really spectacular sprays of stars, et cetera. Yeah, and the cool part of it is, is like, you know, it's trying to see things that you can't see, right? Like that you can't see with your eyes, no. you know, no different than the microscope where we're trying to see things that we can't necessarily see with our eyes, but we can use our technology and we can use, uh, you know, our understanding of the science behind all these things that are moving around and doing these things. 
yeah. um, to see things that we couldn't see before. So we'll, we'll take a couple more minutes. I want to, sh- I, I snatched some pictures. Uh, I stole them from your Facebook feed there. Cause I, I, I'm always really interested in this. I know me and my wife are always like, Oh, you see this one that Ian took and you see this one that Ian took. Um, That's great. That's what it's, uh, it's really, it's really quite a talent, but I, I think it's just a great example for anyone watching out here and you can really get this from Ian all the time is it's that curiosity that drives you right it's that whether it's working in the lab or out in the middle of a field somewhere taking beautiful pictures. um, There's always a And to be honest we're all a bunch of gearheads too. most of the guys that are taking pictures. Sure. (laughs) They they love their gear and uh, I guess I'm part of that. Absolutely. So I I pulled a few I don't you know if you want to give a few uh, you know. like here's one that, that you threw up the last uh, couple of weeks ago. This yeah. is a galaxy we're looking at here. Yeah, so this is um, this is called a grand design galaxy. So you can see in the middle, there's there's the spiral arm galaxy with a very bright core, and those spiral. Uh, so this galaxy lives. It's called M100 or Messier 100, and it's named after a guy named Charles Messier who is uh, living in Paris about 125 years ago. And uh, in those days at nighttime, Paris became very dark, of course, because the lighting was very bad. So it was great to be an astronomer, even in a big city. And he put his little rudimentary scopes up in the sky and he only cared about finding comets. So every time he would find one of these galaxies, like this big M100 galaxy here, he would curse and and make a note of it in his notebook and very carefully (laughs) log where it appeared so that he wouldn't look there again so he could find more comets. <laughs> so in, in essence, the guy actually drove, uh, was, was a fundamental discovery king of, of some of the closer DSOs. And so he has 110 of these objects, very famously called the Messier 110, which I am now trying to take my, my cameras and scopes and go get each one of them. So this is yeah. Messier 100 here. Well, it's a great example of, you know, when we're being told to write everything down in your lab notebook, you know, that's why, right? Don't just say, oh, that's nothing. We've got to keep notes of these things because maybe it is something, right? That's yeah, interesting exactly. to someone else. Right. A few yeah. others I really liked, like this one's just, is that, that's what's behind you. We've been looking at this, this, uh, yeah, as your, it's as your back screen picture. here. Yeah. It is. So <laughs> yeah, this this is, what are we looking at? This is a, a Messier 45. So the 45th one that Chuck Messier found and it's called the Pleiades cluster. And so uh, the star names are particularly cool. I'm thinking, you know, there's one called Atlas and one called Merope and, uh, and uh, a couple of others that I can't remember. But what this is, is a brand new, you see how blue they are, right? Mm. And, and that means they're very young stars and they're very large and hot. So these are the kind of stars that burn brightly, but not for a long, long period of time. Not like our star, which is a, a much more mundane, average, uh, long-lived star. These, these are real burners here. And what's going on here, which I didn't know until one of my buddies told me, is you've got a cloud of gas, these, these little um, nebulous uh, sort of smeared out regions here that are blue, that has somehow moved into the vicinity of this young cluster of stars and is they're not directly interacting, but they, they are layered on to one another. So it becomes this incredibly beautiful deep space object because these uh, nebula are lit up by the radiation that's pouring out of these yeah. hot young stars. And Crazy. therefore it, it, uh, it gives an amazing uh, kind of, you can see it naked eye too. In the winter time you go outside, it's one of the first things I look for just instinctively because it's just like this little blue jewel hanging in the sky. It's so pretty. Huh. And so, yeah, this is my attempt to look at yeah, it. And some other, like, just beautiful shots, right? Like, very, very impressive. Some more nebulae, is that what we're looking at here? Yeah, this is part of Orion. So Orion is like um, a potpourri of, of nebula. It's got everything under the sun. Every, everywhere you look in Orion, there's something else wild going on. So, and so, so is that, that's Orion that we're seeing right there, like the kids would be familiar with looking up at the sky, your, your winter sky, yeah. you can see Orion up there all the time. That's if right. you can if open at, up your telescope and your camera lens long enough, yeah. these things become apparent to your eye, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so you can see what's called the Horsehead Nebula and the red blob over yeah. to the right. And there's a little horse head there, which is a sort of a vacated space 
or it might be dust actually, but it looks like a horse head. So this is a very famous, very uh, often photographed nebula. But what we're looking at in, in Orion is these two very bright stars from the central star and then looking up to the upper right quadrant are two stars in Orion's belt. And, sure. and these nebula are surrounding Altanac, which is this super bright central star here. And uh, you have two very different, you have a reflection nebula and these are, um, these are both, I believe, a reflection nebula, if I'm not mistaken. Cool. Well, yeah. Just beautiful stuff. You know, again and again, beautiful, amazing, like uh, <laughs> really, M1 really talented. Um, I really oh, yeah, love these. The Rosette Nebula. Oh, and yeah. there we have. This one I really love. And I saved my favorite one till last, though, uh, after this one. So this is, uh, I, I think it's taken out near your cabin there. But the, the next one, I think, is my absolute favorite is this one. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. it's called Steve. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> we named it after you, Steve. Yeah. But, so I, I don't actually know what it is, but I see you throw this up there all the time. What, are we, what, what is this thing? So Steve is a moniker. They didn't know what to call it. So they made up some sort of long-winded um, uh, <laughs> name, which, which stands for something which escapes me right at the moment. But what, what it is, is it's, it's relatively uncommon, but it's not super rare. And whenever you have, um, this was taken earlier this year in the middle of winter. And whenever you have a really bright display of Aurora, like I'm talking about where the Aurora come and take over half of the Northern quadrant of the sky, right? So the whole hemisphere on this particular evening, we were out trying to take pictures of scars, stars and the, uh, the Aurora just about killed us because it was, it was just, blisteringly bright and then after it receded what we found was was oh my god it's it's this um this uh, proton uh, jet and and it's called steve and what it is it's about 25 kilometers wide and it's these super super energetic protons that have been deposited by the auroral activity and and it's moving at six kilometers per second and it can often extend hundreds of kilometers. And this one actually went from horizon to horizon. And we learned later that we were in almost into Ontario. This is Sandylands Park here. Yep. And we, we found that this particular Steve extended all the way into uh, uh, Alberta. Cool. So it, it was a monster. Yeah. We well, got a picture. I, just, I just like this name, Steve. That's my favorite <laughs> part of it, just like me. Um, yeah. All right, well, I think, I think we can wrap it up. I, I just, uh, I, I really want to thank uh, Ian Dixon for joining us today. It's always a pleasure chatting with him. Um, to anyone out there, I mean, I, he always has lots to share. He's, uh, he's a perfect example of just kind of following your curiosity. And if, it, you know, if you don't, if you're sitting there in grade 10 or 11 or 12 and not sure what you want to do with your rest of your life, um, just stay curious, right? Like that's, that's the goal. And, and that's what makes a great scientist. I mean, that's what makes a great anything, right? Being curious and want to understand how things work um, can take you really where you want to go. And, and Ian's a, a great example of that. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Steve. You're very kind to me, as usual. Awesome. Well, uh, you've been very kind to me as well. So uh, I'll just, uh, you know, thanks a lot for joining us. I'll just remind anyone out there uh, viewing um, if you uh, want to come back next week, we'll uh, have another one of these Meet a Scientist chats. There's a bunch on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can uh, follow us on Instagram and on Twitter for updates if you want to find out who's coming up next week or in the future. And uh, as always, come check us out at uh, uh, youthbiolab.ca on, um, uh, on the internet. And we'll sign off there. Thank you uh, very much, Ian, Thanks, for Steve. joining us. And um, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for joining right us, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right.